We'll have special counseling for the first time visitors <laughs> at the end of the service. If you have your Bibles, let's open them, to, open them up to Acts chapter 9 as we take the rest of our time looking at God's equipping of Paul. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning, and I do pray that as we look at you equipping Paul for ministry, God, minister to us and how it equips us for ministry as well. And to realize there may be some this morning that are very frustrated, wondering, Lord, why is it you haven't put me into full time of what I believe I'm called to do? Or why, why aren't the doors opening? Maybe it's just a waiting and training time, an equipping time that has to be done before that door can be fully opened, even as you did for Paul. God, you do that for us, and we're going to see that today. But Lord, at the same time, while we rejoice in your word and the promises of your word, our heart goes out to the nation of Israel. And we lift up the nation of Israel to you right now, God. We ask you protect our brothers and sisters that are over there that know you. We ask you protect our brothers and sisters that will know you soon. We ask God that you continue to rebuke the enemy that you only allow, and we know you will only allow what you allow to happen to bring the pressure on the nation to get them to repent and turn to Jesus Christ. And then this whole thing's gonna stop. Pray you give wisdom to Prime Minister Netanyahu and all the leadership. And God, that this would be something where you would again, don't allow any more suffering that, is, that, that must necessarily take place that you know has to take place in order for your plan to, to fall into place. And so God, have mercy on them. Give them your grace and continue to draw them to you as a nation. And I pray if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you, that you would draw them to you as well as we get into the word and the work of your Holy Spirit works through your word. So God, teach us now. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we get into God's equipping of Paul today, you know, we may be tempted to think that Paul was ready for his call in ministry the moment that he gave his life to the Lord. Now, why would we think that? Because remember, Paul was so well-trained biblically and theologically. He had the world's best training, starting from a child all the way up into the feet of Gamaliel, having the best training the world had to offer as far as theology. We would say the best seminary somebody could ever go through for years and years and years, not three or four. We're talking many multiple years, 20 to 30 years of training. And so you would think, man, if anybody's ready, this guy's ready. Well, here's the thing. He was ready from the worldly perspective. He was trained in the world. The problem was he knew the word of God, but he didn't know the God of the word. And it was all religion. And, the, and until we come to know God as the one that wrote the word in a personal relationship, we can learn all the verses we want. We can study the Bible as a literary work, but we're not going to understand the God that we're seeking. We're going to know nothing about it. That was Saul. And so God had to open his eyes and use the training from the world that he had to now have the worldly training shift over into spiritual training. And that's where the equipping comes in that we talked about, where God gives equipping for ministry. Listen, this has been God's pattern throughout history. I'll give you just a few examples so you'll see this and recognize it in Scripture because this is how God works in us as well. Moses, when God called Moses uh, into ministry... Remember, Moses spent 40 years in the world's best training that anybody could get. He was a prince in Egypt. He was, according to some secular writings, he was leading Pharaoh's army. He was a part of Pharaoh's family. He was a, a exalted, the most trained you could ever be in, in the worldly training that you could have. And he heard the call of God at 40. He steps out. He may have heard it sooner, sooner, but he steps out at 40. He tries to make it happen. And remember, he kills an Egyptian. His own people turn on him. And literally, even as that Egyptian died, his ministry died, quite literally. And what he did was, that was the world's training, but he wasn't ready. And so God sent him out to the wilderness. He goes out to the backside of the desert, the Bible tells us. And instead of leading the armies of Pharaoh and being this important leader with all this world training, he has a few sheep in the backside of the desert. By the way, that's where he got his BSD degree, backside of the desert. And that is what God does for many of us. He gives us the backside of the desert, the BSD degree, where God says, you know what? I've called you, but you're not ready. I have to do the equipping, okay? And then after 40 years of that, God sent him back in to fulfill his ministry. Now, that doesn't mean that when we're saved, we can't immediately get involved in ministry. We can immediately serve, we can immediately share, and we should be doing that, diligent in serving the Lord. But there's a time of equipping for your long-term call. What's another example that we see? Again, John the Baptist. The Bible tells us that when John came of age, whatever age it was that he decided to go in the wilderness, he got a little bit older, he went into the wilderness and he lived in the wilderness, no doubt being trained and ministered to by God, getting prepared for the announcement of the Messiah and the repentance of the nation of Israel. It says in Luke chapter 1 verse 80, 
So the child grew, that is speaking of John the Baptist, and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. And so again, we see this desert training. Now, when I say desert training for Moses and desert training for John the Baptist, it doesn't mean boring. It doesn't mean like you're dry. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was probably extremely exciting. What it means is a time to pull away and to get trained up for what God has called you to do. I remember the wilderness training for me. When I first got saved, I was single. I was living in Nashville. And all of a sudden, God started giving me these houses to house it for, this one particular family. And they would go away. And, and I would just, I, I, I waited tables. And I just kind of stayed there alone at that house and would just study for hours a day. Just, just download. I didn't know I was called into the ministry. God knew it. But I had such a, a, an appetite for God's word and studying. It would just go on and on. I look back now and I see that was the years that God was training me, getting me ready for ministry, even though I didn't know what God was planning and what God was doing. And then there was more training, obviously, after that. And, and so this is the same thing that was happening to them. The same thing happens now to Paul. And, and what do I mean by it? Very interesting in, in this chapter, when we get to, and we'll get to it in just a moment, where they let Paul down in a basket and Paul leaves, the next verse says, and Paul went to Jerusalem. But what we have to understand, Paul explains later in the book of Galatians, that after they let him down in the basket, he didn't go immediately to Jerusalem. He went out into the desert for three years in Saudi Arabia. So there's actually between verse 25 and verse 26, uh, there's actually uh, three years where Paul goes out into the wilderness and he's personally trained, he says, by Jesus Christ himself. I found that interesting. Three years. How many years did God train the other apostles, the disciples? For three to three and a half years. Isn't that interesting? I believe that Paul was the one that took the place of Judas. I know they drew straws from Matthias, but again, that was before the Holy Spirit was given. I won't argue with you theologically about that, but I think that was something that the disciples did and not the Holy Spirit. Then after the Holy Spirit was given, God calls Paul, saves him, takes him out to the wilderness, makes his new disciple for three years, and then sends him down to Jerusalem. So we're going to see later when he comes to Jerusalem, it had been three years since he left Damascus. And I'll remind you of that when we get to it in just a moment in the scripture. Then he spends 15 days in Jerusalem, that's all. And they send him away to Tarsus, his hometown, where he goes back to his hometown for 10 more years. So understand this. When you're reading about Paul and come in the book of Acts and all the things that God did through him, this was after 13 years or so of intense personal training from God before God said, now you're ready, Paul, take off. And that was after Paul had the best training in the Bible the world could give. So I'm not saying God's going to take 13 years to get all of us ready. I'm saying that depending on your call, this is going to be a different amount of preparation time and equipping time. Don't be frustrated. If you're waiting, God, why isn't it happening? Continue to be faithful where you are. Wait on God. Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. Stay in study. Stay in training. Do the discipleship classes here at Calvary. Do the evangelism class. Take everything you can. Store up as much information and knowledge. Download everything the spiritual internet can give you. And then when the right time for your program to release, it will. And God's going to have you ready. And this is what we're going to see here uh, with Paul as he does this. Again, you will notice that he does get used immediately, as we said, uh, by uh, when he gets saved. But then again, there's that training time. Now, again, there's a couple of things we're going to note as we jump into this. In these first couple of sections, we'll see that immediately he begins to preach the gospel. And then we'll see immediately he begins to face opposition. And I want you guys to recognize that's how it works. The moment you get filled with the Spirit and begin to preach the gospel, you will immediately get opposition. If you're not prepared for that, it's going to hit you hard. Prepare yourself to realize not everybody's going to like what you're doing. And if you post how wonderful Jesus is, it's not all going to be thumbs up. I can promise you that. So there's going to be some thumbs down and maybe some more aggressive things that are said. We've got to toughen up, not be afraid of opposition. We've got to lose our fear of man. We've got to pray for God to remove the fear of man. And we've got to be bold to step out in ministry. I love the way one a pastor said it. He said, we have to have the skin of a rhino and the heart of a child. So when the harpoons come in, we survive it, but our heart stays tender toward the gospel. And that's what we're going to see that God now is going to do with Paul. Notice what happens here, starting in verse 20. Again, remember, he's been filled with the Spirit. Uh, Ananias has laid his hands on him. He's received his sight. He's, he's ready to go. And, and notice verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Wow. I mean, it jumps from, you're talking about zero to a hundred, like boom. I mean, he's talking, he's like, I, I'm, I'm opposed to Jesus. And then if he gets filled with the spirit the next day, he's like, Jesus is Lord and he's God. I mean, he's, he was like straight, just, there's no break in between. Now you got to love that about Paul, his zeal, his fire and his heart. But I believe that in Paul's zeal, 
he had not yet learned how to present that zeal in a way that was more palatable. And we're going to see that immediately everybody there wanted to kill him. That probably would have happened anyway. When he gets to Jerusalem, they're all going to want to kill him down there. By the way, everywhere Paul went, there was either revival or a riot, okay? So it tells you a lot about his personality. But the thing is, what God needed to teach Paul in these equipping years, these 13 years that will come after what we're reading right here, is how to present it in a way that is more acceptable. You'll still have people that hate you, but it's got to be more acceptable. You ever have somebody walk in the room, you're asleep, and they flip all the lights on? Hurts your eyes, doesn't it? The on-fire Christian that's just been filled with the Spirit oftentimes walks around flipping on airport lights in everybody's eyes. And while what they're saying is true, there's a way to do it. It's better to walk in the room and kind of get the reset going. Remember Jesus at the woman of the well. He didn't deny giving her the gospel. He didn't deny confronting her sin, but he said, could I have a drink of water? I think that's probably a good start. Let's talk a little bit. What's your name? Where are you from? Who are you? And lead into the gospel rather than just walking up like I did as a new believer. Do you know Jesus? And if you don't, you're not going to heaven and all the other things. I mean, and maybe even more abrupt sometimes. I think that Paul, no doubt, would have had some of that in him because of the fire that was in Paul. But again, notice the immediateness of his start. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Whenever you get filled with the Spirit, there's an immediate boldness. There's an immediate evangelism. And again, just the training on how to use that, I think, needed to be there. But this is interesting to me because notice it says, and, and it says, um, immediately he preached in the synagogues. There were, again, reportedly some 40 or around 40 some synagogues at this time in Damascus. And knowing Paul, he probably went to every one of them. Imagine that. Now, here's how it worked in the synagogue. If it was a synagogue service, there would be a time in the service where I would say, okay, if, if there's anybody that has something to share, feel free to stand up and share it. Especially if it was a distinguished guest. Paul would have been known as a distinguished guest he would have been known as Saul of Tarsus, the one that was a part of the Sanhedrin, the one that had even come there to arrest all these crazy Christians, spreading this blasphemy and all these kind of things. And they would see Paul, no doubt, at least the first probably couple of them. Then after that, he probably didn't call on him. He just stood up. But again, they, you know, say, oh, here's the distinguished Saul from Tarsus. Saul, you're here. We're glad to have you today. You have something you have to say. Can you imagine, boy, howdy, do I, right? He stands up and he begins to say, boom, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is our Messiah. He's our Savior. And he begins just to pour this stuff out there. And again, notice this. It says in verse 21 that all who heard him were amazed. And they said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? In other words, you know, this guy is supposed to be arresting Christians. And rather than arresting them, notice he's exalting Jesus Christ. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus. Look at this, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. I love this because, again, there was so much knowledge that was stored up. Again, God has to train us spiritually, but he will use our worldly knowledge at some point if it has value to the gospel. And all that Paul had laid up now is coming out, and that with the Holy Spirit combined, they couldn't stop him. He was proving that Jesus was the Messiah by the scriptures. He was showing that he was God. There was no doubt about it. They knew the word of God as well. And they recognized this guy is teaching the word of God. He's proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And there's nothing we can do to stop it. We can't deny it. That's just how it is. And so notice what happens here. Now, whenever you preach the gospel, that convincingly, those who don't want to hear it, they're going to turn against you. And so here's what happens now. Again, with somebody else filled with the Spirit, that second part we talked about, the opposition. Look at verse 23. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. It's like, you know what? We got to shut this guy up. And he's, because he's proving everything accurately, we've got to kill him so that nobody else believes his truth that he's telling that we can't stop. Again, look how the, the, the blinded mind works. Isn't it amazing? Rather than repenting, how can we stop this guy? It just shocks me when I see this stuff. But that's the flesh. That's how we are apart from God. It says, but their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. That is, they put people at all the gates of Damascus saying, if you see this guy come in or go out, arrest him. We're going to put him to death. And so they realized, Paul, you can't even leave. You're on lockdown, and you've got to stay put where you are. But we're going to see that he had an out on this because apparently there was a believer that lived on the wall of Damascus. Look at verse 25. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through a wall in a large basket. Now, isn't that intriguing to me? Again, it's actually funny that he's leaving in a basket. Now he's right with God. Now he's humble. Now he's got his mind on straight. You wouldn't think this is when he would be the basket case, but he is. You would have thought going in he was the basket case. But either way, 
In jest, I say that, but the reality is, is if Paul had, you know, again, you see, he came in all full of pride and arrogant and ready to take the place by storm, and now God has humbled him and reduced him to somebody hiding in a basket as he leaves. It's not a thing of shame. It's how he had to get out of there. There's honor on Paul, so don't get me wrong on that, but it's interesting to me to see how this heart change in Paul, this life change in Paul, all these things that are taking place where from this prideful man, he's now a humble man broken before God. Now, this is that place where we have a three-year break between verses. Paul tells us in Galatians, as we already noted, he takes off out of that basket and heads off into the Saudi Arabian desert. And Saudi Arabia is right there next to uh, Syria and Damascus in that area. And wherever he goes, whatever he does, God trains him personally. Jesus does, he says, for three years. Wouldn't that be amazing? I bet that three years flew by. But either way, he gets his training. Now, after he's done training, they haven't heard from Paul. Nobody's heard from Paul for three years. No, none in Jerusalem. They don't know where he is. What's going on with Paul? Now, after that three years, in verse 26, we see him heading back to Jerusalem. Look what it says. I'm sorry, verse 23. No, verse 26. I was right. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and they did not believe that he was the disciple. I'll bet. The last time they heard this Paul guy, when he left Jerusalem, he was killing people, putting them in prison. He now went to Damascus to arrest everybody. Yeah, they heard rumors maybe about something that happened to his life. I don't know what all they'd heard or not heard, but he disappears for three years. What if he's been out there again just getting more aggressive against the believers and he's going to come back and be a fake and attack them or do whatever? They were afraid of him, and I think rightly so. But here's the thing. The fruit in Paul's life showed that he was the real deal and a good friend by the name of Barnabas is the one that notices it. Now, guys, note this. We all need a Barnabas. Barnabas' name means son of encouragement. He's the kind of guy that takes the person that's downtrodden or whatever and just lifts them up. He gives that right verse, that right encouragement, that right hug, that right prayer, whatever's needed for that moment. If you're a Barnabas or you're a, 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 a female Barnabas, either way, use that gift. The body of Christ needs you, and the body of Christ needs that gift. And Paul runs into Barnabas. It doesn't tell us how they meet. But Barnabas can tell by looking at Paul's life, you're the real deal. You're not fake. And this is so key because Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. That means what your life is producing. Even as a tree produces fruit, what's coming out of your life? I should be able to look at you. You should be able to look at me and see the fruit that we're producing and decide whether or not we're a true believer or not. Look, anybody can be religious. Anybody can go to church. Anybody can say the right things. But is your life provable by the evidence that you have a real relationship? Is there ever a time you spend reading the Bible? Is there ever a time you pray? Is there a time that you want to go to church and don't just feel you have to? Is there uh, times where you serve not because you think it's just the right thing, a good thing to do because you want to be a good person or because you feel you love the Lord and you just want to do it? Guys, those should be things that are happening in your heart if you're a true believer, making sure that you really know the Lord and you're not just going through the religious motions. Barnabas looked at Saul and said, this guy's the real deal. I've seen the fruit. I saw what happened. And notice he begins to be a testimony for Paul. It says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He brings him into the other guys and declared to him how Paul had seen the Lord on the road. And that he had spoken to him. So Paul no doubt shared this, but now Barnabas is doing it for him as well. Had spoken to him, the Lord did, and how he preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And again, probably Paul even told him, and by the way, I just spent three years in the wilderness. Jesus met with me. He spoke to me. I, I, that's how I met him. And so again, I think how the, the apostles, I mean, they're trying to evaluate this guy as well. Who are you and what happened in your life? But they see the evidence. And so it says he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Paul tells us in another place that was only for 15 days that he was there. And he spoke, just like he did in Damascus, he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. And he disputed against the Hellenists, that is the, the Greek Jews. But they attempted to kill him. Here Paul goes again. Everywhere he goes, people want to kill him, right? And all he's doing is giving the good news of the gospel. It shows you the spiritual battle that takes place. But again, the, the, uh, the aggressiveness of Paul in his testimony and his witness. And when the brethren found out, that is that they wanted to kill him, they, they brought him down to Caesarea and they sent him out to Tarsus. They wanted to protect Paul and keep anything from happening to Paul. So they transported him to Caesarea, which is, you know, up the, further up the coast, which he'll be back later in prison there in his ministry. And they sent him back to Tarsus, which again is where he was raised. That's where he was from. And by the way, between this verse and the next one is where he spent the next 10 years. 
and the equipping time. So three years in the wilderness. Now another 10 years here, 13 years total before we're going to see the next time we see Paul, he's going to have had 13 years of equipping from the Lord. And, and interestingly enough, even as Barnabas introduced him to the apostles, Barnabas is going to be the one to call him back and say, hey, we need you for help in the ministry. And so God opens that door at the right time. So we'll be in, reintroduced to Paul when that takes place. And notice in verse 31, it says, Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So God is now expanding the church. More believers are getting saved, which makes more friends there in Jerusalem and in Israel, although there was still great opposition against them. Uh, God you know, sends Saul away for a while to have his training and his preparation before he can be used um, you know, uh, in the things of the kingdom. And uh, again, a lot of pre, uh, 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 reprogramming had to take place, no doubt, because you think about the disciples. They too were raised uh, in similar ways, and maybe not as much of the worldly stuff or much of the education that Paul had, quite obviously, but the Lord was able to use them right away. For Saul, there had to be a reprogramming and some training. Again, again, here's what I want you guys to grab as we kind of finish this up today, looking at this section here on Paul. Don't think because you, maybe you're not fully equipped for what God has called you to do, that you can't be used right now. Notice he immediately started being used. You can be used immediately. Step out and minister. I had somebody come up to me afterwards and say, would you pray for me? I just don't know what God's calling me and equipping me to do. I said, well, I don't, we'll pray. For sure we'll pray. I said, but your job now is to step out and get going. You just start serving. Once you start serving, God will start equipping. And then when the time is right, as you're already being used in ministry, God will move you into the more long-term ministry that he's equipped you for and called you to do. And God will do the same thing for everybody in this room. He will equip you. He will use you. And boy, do we need equipping in these days in which we live. So we need to allow God to do that in our heart and our life. But lastly, I want to challenge you guys on this as we wrap this up. Is there evidence in your life, the fruit of your life, is there evidence that you're a true believer in Jesus Christ? If you could not prove that in a court of law today, if you could not prove that to someone in this fellowship, I'm not talking about because you go to church or things you do. No, the evidence of a desire for Jesus Christ and a love for God and knowing him on a personal level, you need to come to know the Lord. And that's a matter of just confessing your sin, asking God to forgive you of your sin, and receiving him as Lord and Savior. And I want to just encourage you in this. Like, Lord, the Lord didn't force anybody into the kingdom. When the Lord comes to his bride, he says, will you marry me? He didn't say, tch, tch, you will marry me. <laughs> he doesn't do that. That wouldn't be a choice. That wouldn't be love. He says, will you marry me? And then we have a choice to say yes or no. The Holy Spirit's asking maybe some of you today, will you marry me? Will you be my bride eternally? And you've got a choice. You can say yes, you can say no. He's gonna give you that choice. My urging to you, make the right choice because only those who say yes can enter the kingdom of God forever in the kingdom. Everyone else is gonna be separated from the Lord for all of eternity and I wouldn't wish that on anyone and neither would the Lord. That's why he died on the cross. So I wanna pray for you to have an opportunity to do that as we finish even now. So let's pray. Lord, I wanna thank you, God, for the equipping that you do for us and the equipping that you're doing for us right now. Right now, today, we're being equipped for ministry. Lord, some here have been being equipped for years. Um, some maybe have, have now been equipped, and you're about to reveal to them what it is you want them to do. Maybe some are just beginning that journey of equipping. But here's what I know. You want us to start serving immediately, even as Paul did, as we're being trained for what it is we're going to be doing long term. Help us not to be frustrated. Help us to be patient and to wait, but to step out and serve and Lord, to do what we can do for where we are at the moment. So move in hearts and reveal that to your children in this room right now that know you. But Lord, if there's any this morning that you're saying to them, will you marry me? If there's any you're making your proposal to this morning and they hear the Holy Spirit calling them and they realize they don't have the evidence of a true relationship, it's just been religion. Lord, let this be the moment they make that decision. And if that's you, just begin to pray to the Lord. Ask him right now to forgive you of your sin. Tell him you believe he died on the cross for your sins and receive him as your savior. Father, thank you for the work that you're doing and that you always do. I pray you pour out your spirit on your people this morning. I pray you fill us and let us rejoice at the signs we're seeing of your soon and sudden return and have an urgency, Lord, to, to share the gospel and to bring more into the family before it's too late. 
And God, again, we ask your protection and blessing on the nation of Israel through this horrific time that they're enduring as we stand with you and with your people, uh, Lord, in watching these end times processes unfold. And so we give you all the glory and we thank you for the work of your spirit this morning and ask it in Jesus' name.